Does size really matter when it comes to your brain? And what if the size of your brain affected your intelligence? What if your brain was twice its size? Today on What If Discussed. Hey everybody, welcome to What If Discussed. I'm Peter Smeechin. And I'm Richard Garner. Pete, how's your brain? Well, it depends what you mean. I, I mean, how do I think Scale my brain? Scale of one to ten. Scale of one to ten, my brain is a ten. I, well, my brain's a nine. I think there's a little bit more that I could pack into it, um, but it treats me well, it serves me well. I find uh, I've, I'm able to navigate my way around the world. It reminded me of Jerry Seinfeld in Costanza. He's got the head of lettuce and he, he takes, George, you've gotten a lot out of this particular whatever. Um, what if I told you I could increase the size of your brain? Would you be interested? I would be interested. Why? Because I think that would make me smarter. Am I right? Well, you'll have to tune in to the rest of the show because it doesn't sound, and again, it's a bit complex. I think the short answer is no. Brain size Intelligence doesn't necessarily correlate, but you didn't tune in to hear that from Peter and I. Um, we're going to be talking to some pretty big brains later in the show. Uh, big that, brains mean? Well, by that I mean kind of like back in the day when you would talk about like somebody like the Great Kazoo. The Great Kazoo and the Flintstones. Pinky in the brain. Generally, when we, talk, when we tried to demonstrate intelligence in sci-fi or cartoons, what did we do? Enormous brains. Enormous brains. Yeah. Well, again, as, as you're kind of figuring out already, probably was not necessarily the case in terms of making somebody smart. Well, we'll find out why, I guess. And we will find out why. I have a question for you. Oh, excellent. If bigger brains did make you smarter, mm -hmm. maybe you could only uh, make one part of your brain bigger. What part of your brain would you like to make bigger? That's a good one. And uh, I'm going to go with the cerebral cortex. Do you know why? I don't. I don't know the names of the other parts of the oh, brain. Oh, so, so I'm like thinking like, so if you could make, uh, if you could be better, if one part of your brain is like better at math or like better at building uh, sheds or, you know, cooking or something. Well, would... if we're going to get serious, and we are, um, <laughs> no, uh, discipline. I mean, I, I talk about that all the time. How we're wired affects who we are. There's very few people you're ever going to meet in your life who aren't their environment, plus how they're wired genetically, neurologically. Very few, we do know now with neuroplasticity that we can choose to actively rewire our brains. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes repetition, but it's generally hard. Essentially who you were back in the day is who you are now. I'm somebody that's terrible with discipline, terrible with organization, uh, terrible with sort of, you know, being on time. I know I'm really painting a great resume here for myself. <laughs> so if I could Ladies. go in there with some, uh, with a wrench and some pliers and fix that up. So mm -hmm. I was like one of those, you know, you know, you know, keep the train on the track, yeah. you know, keep the trains on running on time in a way that that was came natural to me, which it doesn't. That's what I would choose you. Hmm. Uh, I would probably choose, um, um, building things. I like to build things, but I don't really necessarily have the knowledge of it. But if I could increase the size of my brain that tells me how to, you know, figure out an, an angle from looking at the, uh, you know, there's so many things that I don't know about building and, and about mm -hmm. some carpentry type things uh, really interests me, but I don't really get it. I'm sure I could just take some YouTube tutorials, but uh, mm -hmm. since we're on the subject of brains, I'd, I'd increase the size of that part of my brain. So if you do get a gift from Peter, that is homemade. <laughs> um, anyways, we'll talk about that more. But uh, this show will include some pretty big brains, as we were talking about earlier. But we do have another big brain to talk about. A genius, in fact. Right, Peter? Yeah, that's right. Uh, one genius that we can talk about is Policy Genius, the sponsor of today's show. Policy Genius is an insurance marketplace. And Richard, do you have insurance? I do not. You, well, some people right now are looking to buy insurance. They have dependents and they want to be able to provide. Uh, but in the midst of a pandemic, some people are thinking, can I even buy insurance? Is it possible? 
Well, the short answer is yes. Uh, Policy Genius will sell you insurance, but they don't just sell you insurance. They provide an insurance marketplace. Policy Genius compares quotes from the top life insurance companies all in one place. It just takes a few minutes to compare quotes from the top insurers to find your best price. And it doesn't really need to take a lot of legwork. You just start the application and they take care of all the paperwork and the red tape. Um, it saves you a lot of time, but you know what else it would save you? What's another thing that you would like to save? Money. Money, of course. So it's going to save you $1,500 or more per year on insurance. So I would go to it. Um, so if you're one of the many people looking to buy life insurance right now, but you're not sure where to start, head to policygenius.com. Policy Genius will find you the best rate and handle the process completely. Then they'll get you and your family protected and hopefully give you one less thing to worry about right now because there's a whole lot of things going on. Yeah, lots of, th lots of things to worry about these days and I don't know about the rest of you, but saving me time, saving me money, giddy up. Yeah, yeah. money, money especially. Uh, so let's get started on what if your brain was twice its size? Okay, let's get to our guest. Michio Kaku is one of the most recognizable scientists in the world, popularizing subjects like physics, cosmology, and futurism through his hundreds of television appearances, as well as the multiple shows he himself has hosted for the Discovery Channel, BBC, and the Science Channel. He's also authored a number of best-selling books, including Beyond Einstein, Physics of the Impossible, and The Future of the Mind. He currently hosts the only nationally syndicated science radio program in the U.S., Science Fantastic. Professor Kaku, you've referred to the brain before, which you've talked about a lot, uh, as the most complex object in the known universe. So I guess two questions. What do you mean by that, and is that still the case? Yes, that is still the case. Uh, the champion for the most complex object in the universe sits on your shoulders. We have scanned the universe out to tens of billions of light years. We see, first of all, no evidence of life, no evidence of intelligent life. And a complex object consists of 100 billion neurons that sits on your shoulders. Now, of course, we can debate how well you use that brain, but, um, but yes, the brain is the most complex object in the known universe. Professor, uh, people have always referred to people with big brains or always imagined people with big brains as having more intelligence. Um, it, but how much does size really matter in terms of the brain? Size is only marginally important with respect to intelligence and the brain. Think of the brain of a whale. The brain of a whale weighs five times more than a human brain. Also, the Neanderthal. The Neanderthal had bigger brains than us. And men, on average, have slightly bigger brains than females. But I can think of a lot of females who are probably more intelligent than a lot of males that I know. And so if you take a look at size, it's not the size so much. It's the composition and the use of the brain that makes all the difference. So people also know you as a theoretical physicist. You can obviously speak to a bunch of different subjects, including neurology, the brain, etc. But connect those two things. How much has physics helped us better understand the brain in terms of the development of that technology, MRIs, etc., over the last 20, 30 years? Well, the brain used to be a black box. We didn't know anything about how it worked. It was just basically guesswork and doing autopsies. Now, with MRI scans, we can actually see the living brain in motion. We can actually see thoughts ricocheting across the brain. We can actually see ideas as they are formed inside the living brain. Now, the most important part of the brain is actually the front of the brain. That's the, uh, the prefrontal cortex. That's where you are actually doing computations right now, trillions of computations, even as I speak, right behind your forehead. Now we realize therefore the different parts of the brain do different functions. The back of the brain is the so-called reptilian brain, the brain of balance, the brain of uh, sexuality, hunger, territoriality. That's the back of the brain. The middle part of the brain is the monkey brain, the limbic system that governs emotions, 
that governs your hierarchy in the tribe. But the front of the brain is the most important. That measures time. If you want to know about intelligence, talk to your dog tonight and teach your dog the meaning of tomorrow. You yeah. can't. You can't explain tomorrow to an animal. That's where the prefrontal cortex comes in. The prefrontal cortex is a time machine, constantly saying, what if? What if I did this? What if I did that? For dogs, it's just, where do I get my next meal? So a couple of monkey brains right here today uh, hosting <laughs> the show. Uh, I would suspect less use of the prefrontal cortex <laughs> But you be the judge at home. Now, this is a good sort of segue because you've kind of bridged now between the brain and the mind. A lot of people confuse those things. They think they're sort of interchangeable. Your seminal book, The Future of the Mind, uh, you know, opened up a lot of minds around the world about the potential, not only that we have now, but looking into the future. Talk about the difference between the brain and the mind. Well, we used to have something called dualism during the Middle Ages, where your soul uh, was separate from your being. And then during uh, the last hundred years, we had the development of neurology. And neurologists said, bah, humbug. There's no separation of the mind and the body. There's just neurons. That's all it is, just neurons out there. Now we're going back to the Middle Ages. We now realize that the mind, where. And the brain is wetware, and you can separate the two. In fact, even after your body dies, your, your software can continue to live on forever. This is called digital immortality. The fact that the mind will survive the body itself. And in fact, I think the future of the mind is brain net. The future of the internet is not going to be digital at all. It's going to be thoughts. We will simply think and have our thoughts spread around the world. When you go into a room and communicate on the web, you will simply think and telepathically communicate to the people of the world. When you want to see a movie, movies are going to be obsolete. Who wants to see a screen with sound when you can telepathically feel the emotions of the actors and actresses. So BrainNet, I think, will replace the internet and we will mentally communicate, mentally download thoughts, communicate our thoughts to the rest of the world. So the future of the internet is BrainNet. So you're saying the brain is just a big organic computer waiting to be downloaded, waiting to have things downloaded into it. How, how exactly would that work? Well, when you go to the library today, you get a book about Winston Churchill. In the future, when you go to the library, you will talk to Winston Churchill. There'll be a holographic image that has all the mannerisms of Winston Churchill, all the memories, letters, speeches stored inside the memory of the computer. I would love to talk to Einstein. I would love to talk to a digitized version of Einstein that has access to all his letters all his interviews, all his writings, everything. And I think one day we will communicate with our great, 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 great grandchildren, and they will communicate with us because we will be digitally immortal. That our thoughts, our mannerisms, our deepest feelings will be encoded and the library will become not just a library of objects, but a library of souls that you'll be able to access the hopes and dreams of your ancestors and basically talk to your descendants. That's the future of the internet. And will we do this with an implant to the brain? How, will, how exactly will it, will it come about? Well, right now we do it with implants to the brain. We can put a chip right on top of the brain and allow you to control an exoskeleton. For example, during the San Paolo soccer games a few years ago, the man that kicked the football initiating the soccer games was totally paralyzed. At Duke University, they put a chip in his brain, connected him to an exoskeleton that allowed him to walk and allowed him to kick the football initiating the games. So today we do it with implants. 
perhaps when we're born. Perhaps when we're born, we're going to be hooked up to BrainNet. So we'll simply think of it as part of daily life. The fact that we can simply think and our wishes come true. We can download any movie, any piece of information, communicate with anybody, and download entertainment and all the emotions that come along with it. And so I think that's going to be the future. The future when BrainNet basically becomes our entry into the universe. Wow, those are uh, those are some big ideas, and but hard not to see the way we're going forward. One of the things that's talked about a lot these days is the difficulty, let's say, with understanding other people. Empathy, really, is, is a problem that has been around for a long time. And intellectually, we can try to empathize with somebody else, but truly, until you've, as they say, walked a mile in somebody else's shoes, you can't uh, know them. You can't know what's informed all of their decisions, their conditioning. Do you see some of what you're talking about being able to finally maybe activate the part of our brain that can truly empathize with another human being? Yes, I think one benefit of brain net is that you will be able to feel the suffering of other people. If you simply read about the suffering of other people, you can say, come on, give me a break. I mean, really? However, if you can feel the anguish, feel the emotions of other people, then of course, there's a whole new dimension there. Now, on one hand, teenagers will love it because they'll be able to put the emotion of their first kiss, their first date, right after every sentence. Right now, they put a happy face after every sentence, right? In the future, you'll put an emotion after every sentence and communicate with your other teenage friends. For adults, we'll be able to empathize and be able to understand where other people are coming from. That it's not a dry act going through the statistics of discrimination, the statistics of inequality. No, you'll be able to feel what other people are feeling. And that's the difference between BrainNet and the movies. The movies is nothing but a screen with sound. That's it, a screen with sound. In the future, you'll have emotions, feelings, memories, along with the image. So it's an incredible thing. We, we start off by asking a question, what if uh, our brains were twice the size? And finding out that it doesn't necessarily correlate to intelligence. But what we have found out too, though, is we're at the tip of the iceberg for not only understanding yeah. the brain, but what we're going to be able to do as, as a species when we better understand and develop our neurological capacities. Uh, I, I never fail to be slack-jawed after talking to you, Dr. Kaku. It was great to have you on today. Where can people find your work these days? Uh, I know you're doing, you're doing television, you're doing your own podcast. Where do you point people that want to find out more about the work that you're doing? Well, go to my website, mkaku.org, M-K-A-K-U.org. It has references to four of my New York Times bestsellers, plus interviews that I've done in the past and uh, well, I'm on national radio. I'm in about 100 radio stations across the country and the internet every week. So you can tune in, but first go to my website, mkaku.org. We also have about 3 million fans on Facebook. Well, we're big fans, obviously, here at What If yep. about making science more accessible. I would put you on the Mount Rushmore of people that have done that over the last you know, 20 30 years and will continue to do so uh, going forward. Thanks again for your time. Thanks for the great work that you're doing. Keep, keep it up, we'll see you down the line. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Professor. So, uh, Richard, mine is not hurting because my brain power is not smart enough, but I'm thinking maybe <laughs> after all that information, maybe does your brain hurt a little bit? Yeah, that's, that's definitely not like popsicle brain freeze level, but yes, I mean, that's, that's it's not drinking out of a fire hose exactly, <laughs> but I mean, when you're talking to a guy like Michio Kaku, I mean, for him, this is nothing. He's talking about brain net like he's talking about the weather, you know? Yeah. It's like, we're, we're almost like, what? Sorry, can you back up? And when you're talking about, first of all, when you're talking about the brain, that's wildly fascinating and deep. Then when you get into the future of the brain and upgrading fascinating. and integrating <laughs> the brain with other whatever, and it's, it's not like our sci-fi hasn't been going down this you know, for for a long time with cyborgs and and uh, and and even even holograms. Like it's interesting. He, the idea that he's talking about there about going to the library, right? One day. So I'll ask I'll ask you this. Yeah. 
We know we can clone, right? We know Dolly the sheep back in the day. We haven't cloned humans. Please, we know we've cloned right. humans, but whatever. For, for this show, we're going to pretend we don't know we've cloned humans, but let's say we clone humans one day. We know we can probably do that. And let's say one day, according to Michio Kaku, that you can download essentially Peter Smeachin's entire, every thought you've had, every, every, every single sort of picture, everything, every memory. Fair enough, I believe it. And you were integrate, okay, you take a clone Peter, organic clone Peter, you take the download and, in, and insert that into this. Is that you? It's not me. Why? Because well, first of all, because I am me, so it would be it could be a rep, it would be a replica of me. But yes. a, even apart from that, I still have the power of future thought mm. of continuing to think. I'm guessing he would only have my past experiences, yeah. so he wouldn't be able to think on his feet. He, like if I asked him, you know. Oh, I don't even know what a question I would have asked 20-year-old me. Well, well, I got 20 a, year I got before now, yes. me. But like, would he be able to think on his feet and just give me an answer? Mm -hmm. Like, what, what do you see yourself doing in the future? I guess I would have known that. It would have been in my brain somewhere. I suspect it feels like probably just really advanced AI, right? Where you're going to see, oh, wow, that's impressive, relative to a human. Yeah. But it's not exactly a human for those but there's those intangible qualities that i would also say whether it was data on star trek next generation or whatever road they go down and trying to do that it's there's always some sort of you know some people say it's consciousness some people might say it's a soul whatever it is there is some sort of differentiation between just the information in the hard drive and the flesh. Right. There's something more to us. It's the mind. Yes. Is that what we were getting at? Which yeah. he talked about. There is a difference between the brain and the mind, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. One of the things he's also a proponent of, um, he sees it as a positive. You know, the sort of the Ray Kurzweil singularity stuff, which people have talked about for a long time. If that's not something you're familiar with. I mean, it's essentially the integration of us with technology. Now, he references the positive that, that um, cyber... Um, a cyber skeleton that uh, people are using for people with missing limbs now. So, for instance, you can connect somebody and all of a sudden they have the use of their legs through these sort of prosthetics or cyber skeletons and all that. So some people see that as a real positive. But mm -hmm. he's like full bore, like that we at some point will be sort of integrated. Like he's talking chips in the head. He's talking. Uh, that's fantastic, too. And the, the thing that I was thinking about that is, OK, it would be great. Just like uh, we're talking the Matrix, you know, yep. you could you could download, you know, karate or kung fu or whatever. In a day. But also, doesn't it give you the opportunity to separate humanity from the haves and the have nots? So people who can afford to have those chips implanted in their brain become the leaders of mm -hmm. the free world, or if it's still a free world. <laughs> of, the, of the soon to not be free yeah. world. And if you don't have the cash yeah. to, you know, upload, you know, the University of London's uh, law degree, you, you, you're not on the same plane as, as somebody who has money. So I think it creates a big divide of rich and poor. Not sure if I'm, if I'm exactly right here, but it does sound now that you mention it, that I believe was the, the premise of Strange Days with, uh, it was um, Angela Bassett and um, uh, the guy that was in uh, Schindler's List. Anyways, the point being it was a sci-fi movie where exactly that, the rich people were the only people who could afford these massive upgrades creating a much bigger divide between the haves and haves nots. Wow, I didn't see that movie. Yeah, but. it's a good, like, I'm, I'm not 100% sure if that's the entire premise. But again, we've, we've gone down these, ro these roads through science fiction, but every time you're talking to somebody like Michio Kaku, you're like, that stuff's not 20 years from now, 50 years, 10 years from now. It sounds like we're on the cusp of some of these things right now. Well, all I can say is I look forward to seeing what happens. And I don't doubt any of this is going to happen. I just don't. I mean, you can't picture it because your brain is not, hasn't got there yet. As they say. When we get that information, we will bring it to you. Join us on the next What If Discussed. If you like this episode and want to spend more time on the topic, click on the link in the description below and check out our extended audio version. We'll be talking with award-winning medical science writer Rita Carter about how having bigger brains leads to bigger problems.